Welcome to the Educational e platform for training in neurological physiotherapy of the Faculty of Physiotherapy of the University of Valencia, Spain. My name is Anna Arnal. I am a physiotherapist specialized in neurological physiotherapy and teacher at the Faculty of Physiotherapy of the University of Valencia. In this video, we will discuss about cerebellar ataxia, its neurophysiological basis and its clinical characteristics in order to understand more deeply the clinical expression of this disease. The concept of ataxia is defined as an impairment of the ability to perform coordinated, smooth, voluntary movements. And by adding cerebellar, it indicates that this organ is affected. The cerebellum is located in the posterior cranial fossa and receives both motor and sensory information, so it is considered a structure which integrates sensory motor information. It also sends information both to the cortex, through the thalamus, and to the spinal cord. So when it's affected, movement is also directly affected in relation to its quantity, and amplitude and direction. This visibly translates into a decrease in the ability to coordinate movements and it significantly affects functionality and quality of life of the person who suffers from it, as will be shown throughout this video. To understand the clinical signs of cerebellar ataxia, we will firstly explain a functional and schematic representation of the cerebellum. In the image, we see that the cerebellum is formed of different zones, which can be explained in relation to its longitudinal axis. In the middle zone, we find the vermis, which regulates muscle control of the axial axis of the body, that is the head, the torso and hips. It also regulates muscle tonus, posture and consequently gait. Next to the vermis, uh, there are the cerebellar hemispheres, formed uh, by a middle and a lateral zone. The intermediate zone regulates the coordination of limb movements, especially in the more distal areas such as the hands and fingers. The lateral zone regulates the general organization of motor activities, synchronization and planning of general voluntary movements. Finally, we see in the image a lower region formed by the floconodular lobes. These are below the posterior cerebellum it is the most archaic part of the cerebellum and it develops at the same time as the vestibular system. So they work together in order to control balance and it also influences in the oculomotor coordination. The functions we have just described work on the basis of a series of afferent and efferent tracts which go to and from the cerebellum respectively. Firstly, there are the afferent tracts coming from the brain. Secondly, other afferent tracts coming from the periphery. And finally, the efferent tracts that start in the cerebellar nuclei and go to other structures and are shown now in the following slides. The afferent tracts that come from the brain are from the cortex, the corticopontos cerebellar tract, which starts specifically on the motor, premotor and somatosensory zones of the cortex and reaches mainly the lateral zones of the cerebellar hemispheres on the side of the cerebellum opposite to these cortical areas. And those fascicles that come from the brainstem, which are the olivocerebellar fascicle, it starts from the inferior olive and reaches all portions of the cerebellum, the vestibular cerebellar fibers, which start from the vestibular area itself and the vestibular nuclei of the brainstem, and end almost in the floconodular lobe and in the fastigi nuclei of the cerebellum. And third, the reticular cerebellar fibers. They start from different areas of the reticular formation and finish in the intermediate zone of the cerebellar regions, mainly in the vermis. Afferent tracts from the periphery, the cerebellum also receives important direct sensory signals from peripheral areas of the body through four fascicles on each side. The two most relevant are the spinocerebellar dorsal tract. It, its information comes mainly from the muscular spindles and to a lesser extent from other somatic receptors distributed throughout the body, such as Golgi organs, skin tactile receptors and joint receptors. This tract reaches the vermis and the homolateral intermediate cerebellar zones. 
and the spinocerebellar ventral tract. It carries much less information from peripheral receptors, but instead it communicates to the cerebellum, which motor signals have reached the ventral horn of the spinal cord, which indicates that this circuit works as a feedback. This tract ends bilaterally on both sides of the cerebellum. As for the efferent tracts, they are mainly three, which start in the deep cerebellar nuclei of the cerebellum, dentate, interposed and fastigi. The first tract leaves the vermis through fastigi nucleus and reaches the bulbus and pontine regions of the brainstem. It modulates balance. The second leaves the intermediate zones through interposed nuclei, passes through the thalamus and reaches the cerebellar cortex and brainstem. It helps to control the reciprocal contractions of agonist and antagonist muscles in peripheral regions of the limbs, mainly hands, fingers and thumbs. Finally, the tracts that leave the lateral zones through dentate nuclei also cross the thalamus and reach the cerebral cortex. They regulate the coordination of successive motor activities starting at the cerebral cortex. Therefore, in summary, the main cerebellum functions are controlling the coordination of voluntary movements and its adjustments in relation to the activity which is being done in order to perform motor activities with fewer errors and more accuracy. This is very important for quick activities. Therefore, it plays a very important role in motor learning and adaptive learning in relation to an activity. And also, it, it is involved in automatic movements, that is, those without a high level of attention required. An example of this can be the automatic gait control centre or cerebellar locomotor region, located in the middle of the cerebellum and which has the function of regulating well-coordinated locomotor movements. After reviewing all of this neurophysiology, we will explain the main clinical signs that appear with cerebellar ataxia. In relation to the oculomotor system, we can find involuntary rhythmic side-to-side -side motion of the eyes in horizontal visual tracking or nystagmus. On the movement of the upper and lower limbs, there can be dysmetry, that is, exceeding or not reaching an object, and with movement planning being affected. Tremor, what can, that can be of action, that is during a movement, and of intention, which is the tremor that increases when you are closer to the object or the aim. Postural tremor can also happen. This synergy, poor coordination of joint movements, or this diadokinesia, it is characterized by slow movement when quick and alternating movements of the limbs are required. On balance and gait, hesitation, that is lack of determination, firmness and security. The head and hips move uncoordinated, that is they move alternatively and do not move at the same time. Also increased postural swinging, it is increased both when sitting and standing. And finally, instability during voluntary movements. There is a poor coordination between a voluntary movement and the postural adjustments required for it. In this next slide, we will show the classification of cerebellar ataxias, that is, ataxias which are due to cerebellar damage. We can find either genetically inherited cerebellar ataxias or acquired or non-inherited ataxias. Inherited ones are generally progressive and can be classified according to the way they are transmitted. The autosomal dominant transmission ones include spinocerebellar ataxias or episodic ataxia. And the autosomal recessive transmission ones usually have an early onset and they can be Frederick's ataxia, which is the most known and frequent type, or Tele telegiactasia ataxia or Wilson's disease. On the other hand, 
there are the non-inherited ataxias that are acquired as a result of different causes, such as congenit abnormality of the cerebellum, metabolic diseases, trauma, infection, tumours or other causes like after a heart attack or after a hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. In addition to the main signs of cerebellar ataxia that we have shown, there can be other very common signs when the cerebellum is affected. Decreased muscle tone and weakness, tendon reflexes abolished and Babinski increased, rebound sign, dysphagia and dysartria, there may be cognitive impairment, loss of vibratory and proprioceptive sensitivity, peripheral neuropathy, Moreover, in inherited ataxias, some systematic clinical signs can also be seen, mainly with childhood onset. Sphincter dysfunction, sensory neural deafness, optic atrophy, skeletal deformities, 75% of patients present kyphoscoliosis, cavus and or equine feet. In Frederick's ataxia, we can also find cardiac conditions with 65 to 90 percent of patients with Frederick ataxia having cardiomyopathy with an impaired electrocardiogram. Endocrine conditions with 20 percent of patients suffering from diabetes mellitus and moreover in telangiectasia ataxia the immune system is affected. Finally, if you are interested in expanding the information, we present here the references that we have used. We thank you for using this digital e-platform.